I guess I could ask that question, how many of us would give up that ham if he showed up? In a way we didn't expect. One of the things my dad used to say all the time, it's, uh, I get it. I do get it. We put a, we, we put a lot, we, we get a lot of plans going on for the day. But God has given us a day, right? How many woke up this morning? God gave you opportunity now. Okay? Again, I want to say, I love the table. Right? What's the table for? Table's a table of fellowship, communion, right? It's the table of remembrance. What do we remember? He said to remember what? His death until the what? The coming of the Lord. Well, you already know what I think about the coming of the Lord. When in it? It's any minute. The minute you start looking for him, I'll guarantee you, he'll be coming to you. you, yes. you there it is, Brother Bud. Where's Lee at? All God's waiting for is the people to say yes. And, and he, hasn't, he hasn't changed. God hasn't changed a bit. So, but I also love the fact that, look, the, the blood, the cross, right? That was God's requirement. God required it. And what that did is it brought us up to the door, like I said. But see, we become alive because of the fact that he got up out of that grave. We're alive because he is alive. We'll sing that song, but that's the truth of it. We are only alive because he's alive. That's pretty cool. That's resurrection life. And when do you do resurrection life? Remember, that was what the whole question was. When is it? How is it? How does all this thing work? And remember he said, dealing with Lazarus, when Lazarus died, he said, I am. That's pretty cool. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Believe thou this. Okay? All right. I have a message today that I want to deal with the provision of God. Okay? That was what, the, that's what I titled it. The, pres, the provision of the Lord. Okay? And it's going to deal with the resurrection. Because was not the resurrection, was not the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the provision that God provided for us? Doesn't that make you happy? Better than old ham, isn't it? Better than a pork chop. And I like a pork chop. Okay? So with all of that, let's go. Let's go. Look, I didn't forget where the boys are at. Where the boys are at. Guess what? The Lord has a provision for them too. Oh yeah. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor. Say God has a provision for you. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, here we go. Let's go to Genesis twenty-two fourteen. Right? Everybody knows this little story, right? Nobody knows this story. This is a story of... Uh, this is when Abraham, right, he's going to take his son. Which one did he take? Oh, his only son. Isn't that amazing that God told him to take his son, and he said, your only son, but if we read it, he had two kids. Okay? Okay? I'll give you a punchline, and then I'll backtrack a little bit. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, right? Everybody know what Jehovah Jireh means? God will provide, right? As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Okay, so I'm going to back up a little bit, all right, and then we'll go on. So we all know the story about Isaac, how Isaac came about, right? The story was what? God told him to do, to do what? God was proving him. How many people in here? All right. Raise your hand if God doesn't prove you or test you. Well, why does he do that? The same reason why he did it to Abraham. 
and Israel and all the rest of the people. Because God, all God's ever asked the people to do is do what he asked them to do. Follow his commands. He didn't ask them to do anything else. Matter of fact, we always think this. Oh, never mind. I'll leave it alone. All right. So here we go. So he said to take what? Take thy son, thy only son. Here was an interesting little thought, right? In verse 2. All right. He said to take now your son, your only son. You know that word that says thine only son? You know what that word means? United. Isn't that interesting? Now, haven't we talked about being united before? Oh, yeah, we live in the United Divided States of America. Right? Oh, yeah, we go to the church of the United Divided Church. Because here it is. Here, here's my thought. Right? You heard me preach this before. Because the Bible says it. God said this. My ways aren't your ways. And my thoughts aren't your thoughts. So this is what we do. Me and uh, Sister Tammy, right? Guess what? A lot of times, my thoughts aren't her thoughts, and my ways aren't her ways. Oh, yeah, and her ways aren't my ways, and her thoughts aren't my thoughts. There's where the issue is. That's why he said, when you take your son, oh, yeah, in the book of Revelation, Jesus said to him, he said, hey, I'm talking to the overcomer. He that overcomes all things, all right? So when we don't think alike, when we don't talk alike, when we don't move alike, we good? So he said, take your son, the one you're united to. Can I say it like that? The one you're united to. You know why? Because the one you're united to, you'll become one. And guess what? We just got done singing a song, God never fails. He picked each and every one of us because he knew you couldn't do it. So you know what he did? Oh, yeah. He brought you to the door. He went into that grave for the three days. And then he got up out of that grave. And then 40 days later, he did what, Brother Bud? He brought and poured out the promise of the Father. So guess what? Now you can do as he does. Now you can have his thoughts. Now you can have his ways. Notice how I said it that way and not the other way. Pretty good. So here we go. So take thy only son, the united son, whom you love, and get into the land of Moriah and offer him what? A burnt offering. It's a sacrifice. I always love this, that Jesus always told the people, right, to pick up your cross and do what with it? Before he ever went to his cross. He was preparing a, person, a, a people, right? And he also said what? He said that if you do what? Look for your life? Guess what you're going to do? And if you don't look for it, meaning, oh yeah, Matthew 6 and 33, you're going to do what? Find it. Because where is your life? If you've been brought over into Christ, where is your life? The Bible says that your life is what? Hid in Christ in God. So now you don't have to be looking for yourself. You don't, you don't have to worry about who you are because you already know who you are. You already have found yourself because you found yourself in him. Because the Bible says that your life is hid in Christ in God. So you know exactly where you are. That's why when you got over there, I, I think I shared 11 months ago, I came up here and I declared to you about the day of the Lord. We know what the day of the Lord is. He says you don't have to be ignorant. You already know. Surely you already know what the day of the Lord is. When is the day of the Lord? It's today. But you know what? We don't see all things under our feet. But we see Jesus. High and lifted up. There's the key. 
All right? Things don't always go the way that we think they're going to go. But we have a promise. We have resurrection life. How many people live in the resurrection life? All the time. You know what the issue is? We do live in resurrection life all the time because if you are into Christ, you, Christ dieth no more, so you do live in resurrection life. The issue that we run into sometimes is if we're aware of it or not. Because everything about us, I've said it over and over again, and look, if you guys, you guys know very well, everything around you is trying to distract you. To do what? Just to get you off the mark. It's not trying to get you to be some no uh, rotten, dirty scoundrel. You already were that in Adam. But when you've been brought into Christ, you're a new creation man. And guess what? The old is gone, and behold, everything has become new to you. And the problem is, we'll take a resurrection life, and we'll try to resurrect an old dead man. Okay? So here we go. So I'm going to bounce around a little bit, because I don't have time for all this. All right? So Abraham, cool, cool thing. He took his only son. What was, and he was taken up there to do what? To sacrifice, to worship. I'll tie this all together. John 11. John 11, verse 1 through, goes to the story of Lazarus. Everybody knows the story of Lazarus? If you don't know the story of Lazarus, go home and read it. All right? I thought this was cool. What's the title of the message today? God will what? God has a provision, right? Here we go. Isn't this cool? This is pretty cool. Anybody know how long Jesus stayed in the town he was at when he found out that Lazarus was dead? He stayed an extra two days, didn't he? Why do you think he did that? There it is, to prove his point. To prove his point. How many times God tarry a little bit in our lives just to prove his point? Well, that's what the whole issue is, Brother Bud. We wish he wouldn't do that. But guess what? He does that. Look, you're doing the whole history of the Bible, and I'll guarantee way back in the beginning of the church, the spiritual church, they were saying, I wish you wouldn't do that. And here we are, all the way down here in 2021. It's like an echo. I wish you wouldn't do that. And we just got done singing a song that said, God, what? It never fails. All right, here we go. So John 11, the story of Lazarus, all right. Raz, um, let's see, verse 6 says what? So when Lazarus heard that, or that Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, right? Jesus stayed there an extra two days longer in that place. Here we go. When all hope seems to be gone. It's a, Critical situation. An answer is needed ASAP. It seems like it's getting more and more desperate. And here we are. Our hope in our Savior stays an extra two days. Divine love is not like Human love. Often they're reverse. Remember when Jesus died and he was on the road to Emmaus and he showed up to a couple of the boys in a different form and they didn't recognize him? And what were they doing? Hmm. Hmm. 
Hmm. Remember, Martha and Mary, they went to the tomb, and what were they going to do? They were going to do what? They were going to annoy him. What do you think they were having a little issue with? Come on now, I'm trying to help you. Look, the boys are in the fire, and they said, "Mm, we're not going to do it. And even if he doesn't, because we love to sing the song, even if he doesn't, well, guess what? Now they're in the fire. I don't know why he did it that way. Right? So here we are, Mary and Martha. They went to the tomb to do what? They're going to anoint him. They were lacking in the little in the faith department, weren't they? Because you know what they didn't do? There it is. There's one of it. They didn't heed the word or what he did with Lazarus. He raised him up from the dead. And he stayed that extra two days just to prove his point. Made sure that he was in that grave, right? Four days. And then remember they said when he went there, they said, well, he, he, he smells now, by now. Right? And isn't it amazing that when he called Lazarus out, right? He was bound in the grave clothes, and Jesus said, when he declared that he was the resurrection and the life, he said, when he has come up out of that grave, he said, now loose that man from the bonds that he's in. And that's exactly what Jesus did to each and every one of us. When he came into our lives, he loosed you from the bounds and the bands of death. And the issue that most believers have is we only look from this dimension. And when God said that I'm the resurrection and the life, he has a provision for you. That's a good word right there. That's a good word right there. That gives me me joy. Because you know what it does? It helps helps us overcome our shortcomings that each and every one of us have as we walk it out in this life. So they loosed them. Let's see here. He came forth, they loosed him, and he said, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Freedom. Freedom. That's true freedom. Guess what he is now? He's united to the one that loosed him. Right? Remember my threefold cord? Remember what we're bound to? We're more worried about unbinding where we need to be more worried about what we're bound to. Okay, here we go. Ah, let's see. Now let's go, let's let's deal with this. Okay, everybody with me? Let's go to Luke 24. You go to all the different Gospels, they have a little different of how the whole resurrection worked. One of the things about the resurrection is, most of us, we don't understand it. We really don't. And I always love this, this is because I've heard this my whole life. Jesus was a special case. Right? Jesus wasn't a special case. Jesus was proving a point that he was fully God and he was fully man. And when he was in the garden, remember when he was in the garden? And he said, he said, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. That shows you he wasn't a special case. He still had his own will, and he could have said no if he wanted to, but he didn't. Because God seen a God, Jesus, right? He seen a greater purpose. Guess what he saw? Look around. That's what he saw. He saw you. That's pretty good. 
Okay? So here we go. So the first day of the week, right, very early in the morning, this is Luke chapter 24, verse 1, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing spices, which they had. We already went through all this, right? And they found the stone that was rolled away, okay? And they entered in and found what? The body wasn't there. Well, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Right? Church still saying that. Where'd he go? Most of us say that. When we have stuff come down the pipe in our, in our lives, that's normally what we're asking. Lord, where are you? Come on now. I've been there. Y'all been there. We've all been there. Guess what? He's there. Because, see, the scripture still says he'd never leave you. So you either, see, the, the, the whole thing about the resurrection, it's really an issue of faith in it if you believe it. Because that's what happened with the boys on the road to Emmaus, kind of like a little bit of what Mary and Martha had going on, because they really didn't believe everything that he said. And see, um, God from the beginning, all he's been looking for is a people, a family, that would do and believe what he says. So he's looking for. He doesn't want anything out of, out, out, of, out of Brother Tim, Pastor Tim, whatever you want to call me, any more than to believe what his word says. Because if I believe what his word says, every jot and tittle of the book, guess what I will have no issues with? Who God has joined me with, where he's put me, where he's placed me. You know that in the Psalms where it says, here's another one. He sets the solitary in the family. You know that word solitary? Oh, yes, yeah, the same word that he used over there dealing with Isaac. And he said, it's your only son. It means united. He sets the united in the family. Guess why? Because they're united to the father. And that's why Jesus, when he prayed the prayer, he said, Father, that they would, those that you've given me, well, who is he given? Look around. He's given you. That we would all be one as, oh yeah, as they are one. Right? Come on now. All right, here we go. And it came to pass, uh, verse number four, and it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabouts. Behold, two men stood there in shining garments. Remember what I said? They're watching all this stuff happening, but the truth of the matter is they had a lot of unbelief going on working in their lives because they really didn't believe a lot of stuff of what he said because they thought he was going to do it a different way than what he really did it. And that's what happens with most of us in our lives. We think God's going to do it one way. Oh, yeah, because the Scripture says my ways aren't your ways and my thoughts aren't your thoughts, but we would like him to do it our way and to have, but he doesn't always do it that way. Really, the truth of the matter is, I don't think he's ever done it that way because I've never found God ever do it the way that I would have done it. Because if I had it my way, we wouldn't be living in Massachusetts. If I had it my way, I don't know if we'd have more people or less people because I don't know what would be easier. I think we'd probably have a different pastor. No, I'm serious. You think I'm joking? I'm not joking. We really would. Because, see, that's the way God does things. He does it not the way you want it. He does it according to his will and his purpose. That's what's so cool. Look, let me ask you. Would have you done the cross? We would have done the resurrection. But guess what? I said this to my mom. Yesterday, did I not say this to you? I said, guess what? You can't have a resurrection without a death. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Not really. Because nobody wants to die. See, that's why we love water baptism so much. But even then, in water baptism, getting baptized in the name of Christ, being circumcised, which is exactly what was going on with the covenant relationship when Isaac was going up in the mountain with his daddy, and he had all that wood on his back, and he was going to take his only son, the one that he loved, and he was going to, oh yeah, sacrifice him. See, that's why we love water baptism, right? Because we think, oh yeah, nobody's dying. But see, if you really understand the real truth about it, the only way you're going to get resurrection license is if you really die. 
And isn't it amazing that that's the very thing that most churches fight over? Church folk. Not, not, not the ungodly. I'm talking church folk. Because, oh yeah, because what is, oh yeah, God wants a people that are united with him. Oh yeah, what? United with what? His covenant. His purpose. His word. If you love me, you will do what? Oh my God, can you believe Jesus said that? The nerve of the guy. To say that for me to love him, I have to do what he says. Who does he think he is, right? Oh yeah, he is the king of glory. The Lord thy God is mighty in the midst of thee. I'm telling you folks. All right, here we go. I don't have time for all this. All right, you're going to have to go home and read this. All right. Uh, verse 5, and as they were afraid and bowed, down, bowed their faces down to the earth, they said unto them, why seek ye the what? Oh, my God. I could go someplace here, but I ain't even going to go here. If you could, got my thoughts, you'll know where I was going. This is the cool thing about resurrection life. See, this is the cool thing about a Christian. A Christian understands Christ like, Christ like what? Living. Where's Christ like living? Christ like living. Where is that? It's in two dimensions, is it not? We see it in the visible. But it's also in the invisible. It's in a realm that we don't understand too much. Resurrection life. The power of resurrection life. Because I get it. I get it. We want to run to the graveyard and everybody pop up. But the scripture says they will in their season, in their order. But God has given us as a people opportunity today to rise up, to stand up. Stand up for what? Oh yeah, to be united with the Father. Okay? So here we are. All right, he's not with the dead, right? Why do you look for him among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he did what? Oh, yeah, he's already told you all this stuff. I got convicted reading this. Because I think of myself, I'm like, my God, how many times have you told me stuff? And because I was having a pity party, as my dad used to call it, or a bad day, He is not here, he is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was with you yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Hallelujah. And they remembered his words. That's what I pray. I pray, God, because your word says that you'll bring all things back to remembrance that you'll bring all your words, every word ever spoken in truth over people, that and I don't care where they're at, I don't care if it's in this room or some other place, that God will bring every word back to remembrance to his people so that we would all be one. Me personally, I'm not worried about me. The most important thing on planet Earth is not you. The most important thing on planet Earth is Christ. It's a people. It's a people. It's a people. All right, here we go. Let's see, where else did I want to go? Let's go to, all right, everybody know the rest of the story? 
right? Everybody knows the rest of the story. You go down, read through there, read through all the other Gospels, how it all worked. You know he got up out of the grave. Amen. Praise the Lord. He got up out of the grave. That's why we're here. Look, I've already said it to you. We're alive because he's alive. God brought us nigh to the door, right? Gave us opportunity so we could come on in. Now that we're in. Then he poured out his spirit, like I said, the, those 40 days later, right? So you could do what? So now you could live the life. If you don't have the Holy Ghost living in you, I mean, look, you know if you got the Holy Ghost living in you or not. If you ain't got the Holy Ghost living on you, in you, you need to get on your face and start praying that God to fill you. He said, remember John the Baptist said this? He said, hey, there's one mightier than me that's coming, right? I'm preparing the way. I'm telling you what Isaiah the prophet and the rest of them all said. Here's one coming, right? And he said what? His shoe lashes, I'm not, wor I'm not even worthy. I can't even humble myself enough to even undo his shoes. And he said he's going to baptize you not only with the Holy Ghost, but that he'd baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Because God wants to consume, I'm telling you, God wants to consume everything that is anti-Christ in our life. You know, we want to celebrate resurrection, but you know how the best way to celebrate resurrection? Let the fire of God consume everything that's in you that is not of him. And we all have it. And guess what? It's not going to happen overnight. Because this is what, this is what we just said, Brother Bud. I wish you wouldn't do it that way. But you know what he lets you do? He lets you walk it out. And that's why Brother Tim always says, you become the arrows. It's your responsibility to sharpen, hone the point, and then he just ding, 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 ding. He shoots you in all. Look at around. You're all in different families. You all go work at different places. You shop at different places. Very rarely do any of us all go to the same place on a daily basis. Very rarely. And it's all that you would do what? Oh, yeah. Like the song said that we sang at the beginning. Okay? All right. One last scripture. Revelation. Verse 1, or chapter 1, I mean. Verse 18. This is Jesus. He's declaring it to his people, to the family. He says, I am he that liveth. And what was he? He was dead. But guess what couldn't hold him? The grave couldn't hold him. You know why the grave couldn't hold him? Because he did everything that the Father told him to do. Remember I said, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but... So what do you think would have happened? Oh, my, I can't even know if I can go there. What do you think would have happened if he would have said, mm -mm, I ain't doing it? All right, here we go. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive for just a little bit. All right. So, when the scripture says, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. Draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. What do you think that means then? So do you think that means that when he declares that I am alive, right, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and had the keys to where? So let me ask you. This is a tough question. So what happens if you go to sleep? Nobody wants to go to sleep. I have a hard time sleeping. I do. I have a hard time sleeping. But nobody wants to go to sleep. But God numbers our days. And if he says, see, this gives me great hope, right? Look, I'm not talking about, I, want, I don't want that. Look, we're celebrating resurrection life. I want resurrection life. But you know what? This gives me hope. He says, because he never dies, and if I be in him and he be in me, I don't even have to worry about it. I remember Brother Bud sitting here, and we were praying for all the people and all this stuff, and this word kept coming out. They're non-issues. They're non-issues. 
we make more issues out of non-issues than what the real issue is. And the real issue is, is the resurrection life. That lives where? Yeah, he lives in me, but it's more collectively what he lives in us. Because the minute we get our self-centered focus off of ourselves and we start thinking about the body, what was the whole thing about, what was the whole purpose of the resurrection? It wasn't about an individual, it was about the body. Yeah, it made me think that too. Take self-focus off. Look, you ought to be happy you got a pastor and had a pastor before me that was not self-focused. My dad came here and he preached the Christ. He preached the corporate man. Paul the Apostle had the greatest revelation of that time of talking and preaching the Christ. He introduced the Christ to the church, to the Gentiles. And guess where he'd be right now? Oh yeah, he'd be alive forevermore too. See, I love the scripture where it says, right, when we deal with this, look, I get it, I get it. He said, remember the death, but he said, live in the resurrection life, right? But he said, right, he said, hey, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. And I always loved the Mount of Transfiguration. What to, who showed up on that mountain? Anybody know? Moses and Elijah. And guess who knew who they were? Peter, James, and John. Now, how do you think that happened? They didn't have Facebook, and they didn't have their phone, and their bitmojis, and all of that, all that stuff that we rely so much on, right? They knew because of the Spirit. And isn't it amazing that when they were up on that mountain, them three boys... Not Peter, James, and John, but Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. What were they talking about? They were talking about his death, his demise. Can't have no resurrection without a demise. In our lives, where we put it, you can't have resurrection life fully working in you until you lay everything down and let it die. That's a good word. That helps us. That helps us. And guess what? I'll leave you with this note. Jesus said, oh yeah, I already said this. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he's our advocate. And we have an intercessor that prays for us when we don't know how to pray. And a lot of times, we don't know how to pray. So what we do is, we do travail in birth until what? Christ be fully formed in us. Amen? I love you all. I appreciate, I love Resurrection Day. But you know what? Resurrection Day is every day. There it is. We must walk in it as a people. Right? All right, come on, brother. Let's do communion. Come on, everybody, move up to the front. You know how Brother Brad always did that? Let's make it easier.